next the next speaker will be uh, Professor Brodzinski. Uh, Professor Brodzinski is a neuropsychophysiologist uh, um, and neuroscientist, uh, presently Professor Emeritus in the Department of Psychology at Brook University of uh, Canada. Professor Brodzinski is a former director of the Center of Neuroscience and Professor of Psychology and Biology in Brock University. Uh, he's uh, the, the, the prestigious the, the, the prestigious the, uh, award, the outstanding achievement award from the International Behavioral Neuroscience Society for his uh, contribution to the field of behavioral neuroscience. And uh, due to the problems, uh, the, 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 due to the uh, connection problems, we will play the uh, the, the lecture the lecture. Uh, so and after after this, of course, uh, the, the Professor Brzezinski is with us, and he, uh, the, and he will answer all uh, all the questions. So uh, okay, so have a nice have a nice lecture. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone. I would like at the beginning to thank organizers for for uh, setting this interesting symposium and for inviting me to present to you uh, my lecture. Uh, I would like to talk about mechanism of emotional arousal, nature of that arousal, mostly based on rat studies and ultrasonic vocalization. I will be talking about the characteristics of emotional arousal, its biological role, and the description of ascending reticular emotional arousal systems, anatomical characteristics of the systems, cellular characteristics, and behavioral characteristics, and some features of, uh, on, of encoding the, or, or elevating the emotional state during the, the, this arousal. For general, uh, for the beginning, the general idea about character and uh, characteristic of emotional arousal are several features listed here. Emotional arousal develops very fast within 100 to 20 milliseconds as studies in human responses to auditory, uh, auditory stimuli like infant cry. Emotional arousal is associated with the subjective feelings of specific valence and it develops the full cognitive, uh, emotional arousal develops before the full cognitive analysis of the event by the brain, which in humans takes about 500 milliseconds. Negative emotional arousal stops other ongoing activities of the organisms. And in this talk, I will be mostly talking about uh, negative arousal because it was simply studied more in our laboratory. Emotional arousal is maintained for some time by loops between the tegmentum and forebrain, which is characteristic for the arousal that it lasts certain time. It is not short. A emotional arousal potentiates attention processes, and it may lead to development of the full uh, emotional state with endocrine and atomic components within two to four minutes. The general biological role of emotional arousal is modulation of cognitive processing by enhancing processing of salient stimuli while reducing processing of non-salient stimuli. So environmental stimuli with emotional value will, be, will initiate emotional arousal and that would lead to modulation of cognitive processes, for example, attention or memory. Cognitive and emotional arousal are parallel systems. In yellow color is marked the classical cognitive arousal system, a reticular activating system. In, it starts from the brainstem reticular formation. This is the stippled yellow area, and it is targeting the all cortical, neocortical areas. While the Emotional arousal system originates from fragments of the, uh, of the, uh, of the brainstem, from lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus and ventral tegmental area, and the projections are going innervating the subcortical areas, only uh, to set only a small area of prefrontal cortex, and the rest is subcortical. The lateral tegmental nucleus is marked, it's 
terminal fields in a green area and ventral tegmental area in red area. The laterodorsal tegmental nucleus innervation comes from so-called mesolimbic cholinergic system. This is ascending system up and it is responsible for aversive arousal. While the ventral tegmental area is well-known projection of mesolimbic dopaminergic system uh, innervating mostly nucleus accumbens and is responsible for appetitive arousal. So those are two different arousal systems because the, the aversive arousal and appetitive arousal have to prepare the organism for two different type of responses. Those ascending emotional arousal systems are very extensive and diffuse, innervating large areas of the brain. On the left hand side is ascending mesolimbic cholinergic system, on the right hand side ascending mesolimbic dopaminergic system. They start from small group of cells and they, the axons are uh, um, diffusely innervating entire brain actually. Though if in cholinergic system, those, those uh, innervation, the innerv innervation as shown here in the mouse cortex uh, is very, very dense. The uh, axons are thinner and thinner and they communicate by varicosities. Those are the, the bulges on the axons which can release transmitter. So the system here in the, on the lower part, you see the enlarge, enlargement there are branching axons, then dense uh, and intricate cholinergic fibers. Uh, numerous varicosities marked here by arrows, and uh, they are small. Uh, the smallest are is about 0.6 micrometer. What is characteristic for all these numerous varicosities is that only 60 to 85 percent of them uh, creates synaptic contacts. Other are releasing transmitter acetylcholine in this case and in the mesolimbic dopaminergic system dopamine in non-synaptic way. On the right hand side there's uh, you can visit you can see one varicosity which do not create synaptic contact and releases transmitter in this case acetylcholine uh, as a volume transmission. At the lower part, you see the synaptic contact and some of the varicosities, 25% of them, create co-synaptic contact, but still some transmitter can be uh, released outside as a spillover. So if the uh, red um, or reddish neuron is the cholinergic neuron, in lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus, it goes, uh, this is only one branch shown here, goes for large distances and has numerous varicosities here along the axon, uh, only some of them create contacts with dendrites of neurons and other release acetylcholine in non-synaptic way. Each of the varicosities produces acetylcholine and releases it in each varicosity. So if you imagine how many of those varicosities is, uh, is in the brain and how, um, how densely they are um, spaced, uh, here 20 micrometers is diameter of a large neuron and 0.6 micrometer is by red uh, dot shows the diameter of one varicosity. So one action potential going along such axons releases acetylcholine on immensely large areas of the, uh, of the brain. This is massive release. In the prefrontal cortex, the, this diagram shows cholinergic and dopaminergic terminal, not terminals, the axons, and some of them are close to each other, some not. The green color shows the uh, varicosities of the cholinergic system, and the blue one, the varicosities of the dopaminergic system. In some areas, those, those axons are very close to each other. And the diagram in Bs and the B prime and D prime shows those uh, axons close to each other, cholinergic green, dopaminergic blue, and varicosities on each of them are shown by perpendicular lines. In D, the cholinergic axon is distant from dopaminergic axon and also has varicosities, they are shown here. 
What is interesting that when those do the cholinergic and dopaminergic axons are close to each other, there is significantly larger number of varicosities. So undoubtedly they communicate with each other at this level. While if they are separately, they, there is less varicosities and smaller release. We studied this uh, in cholinergic system. We studied this release and what uh, acetylcholine is doing to postsynaptic neurons or to the vicinity of the of the uh, release acetylcholine. We implanted electrical electrode in the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus for electrical stimulation, and we recorded for the, from the terminal fields in this case anterior hypothalamic area from single neurons by multibarrel pipettes, which allows us co-injection of acetylcholine or scopolamine to study the cholinergic natures of those neurons. What is interesting is that any stimulation of lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus has effect on spontaneously active neurons on anterior hypothalamic area. In A at the top, you see the spontaneously active neuron, each of those dots, small dots, is at one action potential. At the S stimulus, uh, the stimulation of lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus occurs. After stimulation, marked here by a red bar, is a silence. The neurons are in firing rate is inhibited. If the current of stimulation is larger, the inhibitory area is longer. The inhibitory time is longer. There is actually linear proportional relationship between stimulation intensity of stimulating current and, and the length of this inhibition. So the massive release of acetylcholine is inhibiting firing rate in large areas of the forebrain and, um, and midbrain and um, the diencephalon. Here we repeated this with cholinergic, uh, which the stimulation with carbacol, so pharmacological activation of those neurons and release from the pipette. Carbacol inhibits firing rate. If it is pretreated by scopolamine, which is mascarinic antagonist, the ejection of carbacol is, does not cause us the, the, the uh, inhibition of firing rate. That was repeated again. Carbacol decreases firing rate pretreated with scopolamine is effect, effects is non-significant. And the same shown here at the bottom in a bar graph, spontaneous uh, firing rate at the beginning, then stimulation of LDT causes significant drop of firing rate. And as soon as the electrical stimulation is stopped, firing rate uh, returns back. Or um, as uh, ejection of carbacol, when it is stopped, firing rate returns. Pretreatment with scopolamine uh, cancels that effect. <coughs> the vast areas of the ascending cholinergic fibers are innervating many regions of the brain. Here on the left hand side, you see the uh, dots which are showing active neurons, which we tested. And it was 83%, the graphs on the bottom shows that 83% of neurons with inhibitory responses, they were shutting down their activity. Only 10% of, uh, of, of neurons responded with increase of activity rate and 7% <coughs> did not show any uh, change. We wanted to know that the, the areas from which we recorded electrical activity are directly connected to a lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus and axons from lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus reach those areas. So we injected the uh, retrograde fluorescent dye, DIA, which is shown here in a bluish way on the left hand side. And after exposure time, <coughs> we found groups of labeled neurons in lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus. It means that those neurons have direct uninterrupted connections with axons up to those areas from where we recorded um, neurons. Next question is whether those 
direct axons are really cholinergic in nature. So we injected, uh, we have selected from the uh, terminal fields of cholinergic system, distant area of lateral septum. <coughs> this is marked on the right, right hand side by green color and injected into the septum uh, fluorogold retrograde label, which was again transported through axons to their cell bodies. Then we looked at laterodorsal tegmental nucleus and we found in blue here, <coughs> many neurons retrogradely labeled. Then after labeling those neurons with uh, antibody against acetylcholine transferase, that means showing cholinergic neurons, we found significant numbers, double labeled cells, like at the bottom here, the same neuron is labeled for fluorogold and for acetylcholine transferase. That means that those direct connections to entire terminal field from lateral dorsal tegmental um, area, those neurons are cholinergic and release acetylcholine at the terminals. So summarizing what I said roughly until this point is that incoming stimuli activate the reticular system of the brain, including the emotional arousal system. The ascending mesolimbic system for emotional arousal diffusely innervates vast areas of the subcortical limbic regions. <coughs> the ascending axons have many branches and numerous varicosities. It was tested about two to six million of varicosities per one cubic millimeter. This is very extensive cholinergic innervation. As shown for the cholinergic system, most varicosities release the transmitter non-synaptically as the uh, volume transmission. This ascending system, both ascending systems quickly innerve, uh, initiate emotional arousal within 120 to 20 milliseconds. And emotional arousal stops ongoing, the negative emotional arousal stops ongoing activities of the organism, uh, causing behavioral inhibition, presumably by massive inhibition of firing clay in large areas of the limbic system. The dopaminergic system causes very brief stop of uh, um, decrease of activity, uh, but it also has inhibitory uh, effects on the postsynaptic neuron. <clears throat> and after that, after that arousal, as the next step, the ascending mesolimbic system activates or modulates neuron's brain regions for the initiation of adequate response. The first interesting feature of emotional arousal, as I mentioned at the very beginning, is that it lasts for a certain time. This is caused by loops between brainstem and forebrain uh, limbic areas. That was proven by Nota in 1958 in marked here by red arrows. In limbic midbrain area shown here by LMA, that includes part of the reticular activating system and the lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus and ventral tegmental uh, area. Now LS, those are um, limbic, diencephalic and forebrain structures and all those vast areas, terminal fields for those systems ascending from the brainstem and those loops keep them for a certain time. And that we believe is the um, mechanism of maintaining uh, emotional arousal for some time. <coughs> it was uh, recently suggested by Sakaki that the, 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 depending on the stimuli, which both cause emotional arousal, the processing of uh, or further steps after emo initial emotional arousal depends on the stimuli. The stimuli which are important for survival or um, reproduction cause emotional arousal, which very fast activates in almost automatic way uh, pro cognitive processes and like attention, memory, and other responses. However, social emotional stimuli, which also initiate quickly emotional arousal, have slower processing and they require more time to affect cognitive processing and make decision what, uh, what response is the most adequate and that will include vocalization and some motor responses. 
So vocalization is one of the consequences of the, um, the activation of ascending uh, emotional arousal system. And you are very familiar with all those types of um, vocalization, 22 vocalization is long calls for, with uh, with uh, stable frequency or short shorter calls with stable frequency or 50 kilohertz vocalization in higher frequency of flat nature or frequency modulated na nature of different sorts like step calls, trills, step trill combinations and other. This variety of vocalization is of course released uh, depending on the decision which arch, uh, animal uh, undertake as a result of emotional arousal. So emotional arousal leads to the decision taking in, includes many areas including prefrontal cortex what decision to take. We can show that in a, in a diagrammatic way how that decision can occur. Animal can uh, make decision to vocalize all by ultrasonic calls or audible calls. Audible calls are emitted automatically. This is extremely fast, aversive, and uh, those are the well-known squeaks or screams. If animal undertakes the uh, decision to emit ultrasonic calls, there are, again, two uh, choices. So each step labeled with number is binary, has only two choices. So if ultrasonic, if they are aversive, they go to 22 kilohertz calls. If they are appetitive, they are 50 kilohertz calls. Now, if aversive, we have again two choices, short or long calls. If they are appetitive, flat or frequency modulated calls. Then frequency modulated calls, again, we have dichotomy, 50 kilohertz calls with trills or 50 kilohertz calls without trills. We can continue further like that. So step by step, the brain can take, can makes decision uh, what uh, what calls to emit depending on the behavioral situation as a result of emotional arousal. There are other features of behavioral um, behavioral manifestation of emotional arousal, not only uh, vocalization. Here we we we, we you see the decrease of locomotor activity after injection of carbacol, which uh, causes the same as massive release of acetylcholine. This is mapping of the rat brain, which shows with black dots areas which cause significant um, behavioral inhibition. The larger the dot, the, uh, small, the, the bigger the inhibition. This is expressed as percentage of control. Now, the triangles show the actual opposite increase of locomotor activity. So the areas from where the decrease of locomotor activity and behavioral inhibition occurs is exactly the fragment in here, fragment of the terminal fields of ascending cholinergic fibers. If we uh, put that in layers into the diagram, uh, from top to the bottom, you see this is uh, this is the area below the control, the area uh, of behavioral inhibition, which is exactly fragment of the ascending system, cholinergic system. Now the dopaminergic system causes opposite response. So injection of amphetamine will increase locomotor activity. Uh, the dots on the left hand side show areas in the shell of nucleus accumbens and around, which increases vocalization of 50 kilohertz calls in rats. And from the same points on the right hand side, you see increase in locomotor activity compared to, uh, to saline injection of, or uh, spontaneous control. This is shown for rats with so-called low line, that means which are not very responsive to amphetamine, and high line, which are highly responsive to amphetamine, all of those groups show significant two to three times increase in locomotor activity. So locomotor activity is another feature of emotional arousal, but it is less, um, less um, convenient to study emotional process or emotional arousal itself. We have more features. There is, I, I, this is beyond the topic of this um, uh, talk. 
to list all the um, consequences of emotional arousal. Here is, for example, increased drinking induced by carbacol from vast areas of the brain. The higher dose, which is on the left, the higher is the volume of water um, intake uh, in rats. But this is less interesting for our talk. It's only I only show you that not only vocalization, but many other behavioral features could be used to judge the emotional arousal. However, vocalization is the most um, uh, convenient for, for studying emotional arousal. There is not many uh, studies on rats showing different aspects of um, uh, emotional arousal as studied by the modulation or changes in vocalization. But there were such studies done on cat's brain. So I want to tell you at the very beginning that both species have homolog systems. Injection of carbacol in cats causes emission of aversive vocalization in form of growling from the areas which are almost exactly homolog to the rat brain, where injection of carbacol causes from those brains, from those areas, aversive vocalization in form of 22 kilohertz calls. Both of those innervations originate from lateral dorsal tegmental area. So those um, those are like, uh, those are um, homolog systems. <clears throat> so I will show you some results from cats to demonstrate the aversive nature uh, of, of of the response. When we inject carbacol to the um, to the brain, the um, the the, um, the animal is seeing entire environment as threatening, as unpleasant, and pays attention to any feature of the environment which might be threatening. It usually responds with prolonging individual calls. That was not carefully studied in rats. That's why I will show you that on the cat's brain, on the cat's responses. Here is the course of vocalization as accumulated vocalization time. So duration of individual calls is summated together. And after injection of carbacol marked with red arrow, the uh, vocalization increases very quickly and then gradually decreases over half an hour. Now, during that time, if we try to provoke animal or stimulate animal by just being close to it, uh, which was shown here by the black bars below the, the diagram, uh, the animal will respond with modulating its vocalization, prolonging time of vocalization. Those cats are familiar with humans and friendly with humans, but after injection of carbacols, humans now present danger to them. So if we are uh, extending a hand to the cat, immobile, just extending and keeping the hand like that, uh, the animal does not change it very much, not significantly its vocalization. The, the lowest line is the control. But if we begin to move that hand, wave the hand to the, to the rat, to the cat, then it significantly increases the duration of vocalization of individual calls during those times of movement. This is movement of the threat, potential threat objects. Now here it is analog experiment, but now we change the parameter of distance from human to the to the cat. Again, black bars is the time of provocation. So we approach the rat from about 10 meters and we're standing there, just standing 10 meters from the cat. There is not much change in the responding. The lowest uh, line is the control. The, uh, uh, the response after 10 meters is not significantly changed. Then we approach to three meters to the cat. Again, there, there is some response in the, in the second and third repetition of the stimulus. But when we approach to one meter from the cat, the time on individual calls was significantly increased. So the distance to the threat appears to be important during emotional arousal. And here we uh, repeated that experiment again on cats. Now, this time for uh, the auditory stimuli. We presented 250, 250 hertz tone, and that did not cause any change in vocalization compared to control. But when we applied through the loudspeaker dogs barking, you see extremely significant increase 
in duration on individual calls summed together over this period of time, which is five minutes. So in this time, uh, the acoustic stimuli were important. So animal is uh, animal is is it's a emotional arousal is uh, is raised, and now the animals is the, the its sensory systems and the emission of vocalizations are uh, um, operating at different level. Uh, the reason I showed you the three uh, results on cats are important from that point of view that vocalization, including ultrasonic vocalization, contains a lot of information about what is important for animals or not. What features in this case on the aversive response, which features are important and uh, which is more or less important to the, to the animal. It, uh, we record usually number of emitted calls, but the information is also coded in duration of individual calls. It was noticed in, uh, in, in rats with 22 kilohertz calls, the duration of, talk, of those calls varies depending on the behavioral situation, depending on the severity of threats, but it was not really carefully studied. This experiment clearly shows you that the, the, the relationship. So if I would like to conclude to make a summary of not only the results I presented, by general understanding what the ascending mesolimbic systems are uh, doing in the brain. So the ascending systems, cholinergic for aversive states and dopaminergic for hedonic states, influence at vast areas of the subcortical brain structures. The mesolimbic systems work, for, uh, work very fast by direct and branch connection and massive release of transmitters via varicosities that flood vast areas of subcortical regions with the relevant transmitter. Dopaminergic system does the same as cholinergic system. Uh, although the, the terminal fields were less studied than in cholinergic system, that's why uh, that, that in, in uh, aversive responses, that's why I focused mostly on aversive system. Emotional arousal is maintained for a prolonged time and associated with subjective feelings that focus the organism's attention on the salient stimuli. Emotional arousal activates sensory and motor system, prepares the organism for an upcoming situation, and causes emission of vocalization as a social signals. This is equally important for the animal as individual preparation for the incoming uh, salient stimuli. The state of prolonged emotional arousal increases animal sensitivity to all physical aspects of the salient stimuli, which is characteristic for emotional state. An emission of species-specific and valence-specific vocalization reflects the level of emotional arousal as studied for aversive situations in what I presented in here. What is the most important, not listed here, but I should emphasize that, emphasize that, that aversive emotional arousal is carried on by two parallel systems. Mesolimbic, ascending mesolimbic cholinergic system and ascending mesolimbic dopaminergic system. The consequences of activity of those systems is not the same. The organism is, pre organism is prepared in two different ways to the appropriate stimuli, emotional stimuli, and each system has even reciprocal preparation. For example, uh, motor and locomotor activity. One system is decreasing activity, the other is preparing the animal by uh, increasing its um, activity. Thank you for your attention. I wanted to acknowledge some of my colleagues who, from at least three universities um, who contributed to fragments of the research which I presented here and uh, supporting organizations, uh, for most of them from Canada, all of them from Canada, um, uh, which supported different aspects of that talk. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for preparing this lecture, Professor Brzezinski. Um, there are some questions. Some of them are in uh, question and answers. So I'm going to just read it because they are asked by anonymous attendee. 
So is PTT gene neurons also part of a negative arousal system? Uh, what PPD, the different uh, cholinergic nucleus, right? Yes. Uh, no. There are, there might be some neurons in there who are contributing because the division into uh, nuclei is very artificial. And some neurons are not obeying the boundaries of nuclei. But in general, PPT is projecting in different areas. Uh, big part of it is descending, not ascending. And this is uh, almost exclusively the uh, pedunculopontine, um, more, almost exclusively lateral dorsal tegmental nucleus. Okay, and then we have another question. Uh, how each area of the brain differentiate different sources of acetylcholine? This is, this is difficult to answer. Uh, yes, the, this, this re massive release of acetylcholine may have different effect on different parts of the brain depending on the postsynaptic receptors. There, are, there is five subtypes of cholinergic receptors and each of those uh, subtypes carries different response. So uh, there might be regional differences. I did not study that, and I don't think there is study carefully mapping postsynaptic cholinergic receptors and um, correlating them with responses. But there are, there are some studies which are showing that, yes, postsynaptic receptors will decide about type of response. Um, what I focus on in my talk is just present a general rule rather than saying what is happening in each of the structures. Secondly, uh, this is um, after the arousal or during the developed arousal. There is almost entire brain involved in it, particularly with strong arousal, strong emotional arousal in dangerous situations. So uh, it's almost sure that different parts are responding in different way or responding in a parallel way. But the, exactly what part and what recept, post-synaptic receptors, I don't know. Well, I hope that, answer, uh, that answers the, the question that the person has asked. Uh, 